No one knows, probably not even the Russian government, exactly how many people perished as a result of the many purges, labor camps, and other punishments that occurred during the life of the Soviet Union, which existed from 1917 to 1991. Reliable estimates have put the number over 10 million, and perhaps as high as 20 million or more. Most, but certainly not all of those deaths, occurred during the reign of Yusuf Stalin, a genius in the exercise of raw power, but otherwise a paranoid megalomaniac with few equals in history. In today's video, we are going to tell you about some of the terrible events that occurred during the life of the Soviet Union, or USSR. In the mid-1980s, Mikhail Gorbachev, a communist reformer, became the premier of the Soviet Union. When he came to power, he understood two things almost immediately. That the Soviet economy needed to be restructured and people allowed more economic freedom, and that many people were dissatisfied with life in the USSR, but did not dare speak of it for fear of government repression. Knowing that this fear and dissatisfaction was liable, sooner rather than later, to spill over into public discontent, protest, and perhaps more, Gorbachev instituted the policy of glasnost, or openness, which allowed people more freedom to speak their minds. This also held true, to a certain extent, for members of the government and its many organs. The immediate spur to glasnost was the awful events that took place at the Chernobyl nuclear plant in Ukraine, then a part of the USSR. Attempting to keep the radiation leak secret from their own people and the world, the Soviets finally had to admit that they had a very large problem at Chernobyl, and this was partly caused by people's fear to speak up about the problems there and in the aftermath of the nuclear disaster. One of the many secrets to come out of the shadows under Glasnost was the fact, which was actually well known inside the USSR, but which people were afraid to speak about openly, was that Soviet troops driving towards the center of Berlin in 1945 fired on each other in a race to be the first to reach the German capital, the Reichstag. Though many of the incidents were described as the typical friendly fire that occurs in the close combat of war, in urban areas especially, many firefights between Soviet troops occurred purposefully. The two Soviet army groups were commanded by rivals Georgi Zhukov and Ivan Konyev, who had raced each other across Eastern Europe, both hoping to be the one whose men raised the Soviet flag over Berlin. Stalin, had drawn a firm line between the two massive armies to avoid both confusion and conflict, but removed that line when both army groups were within 40 miles of the Reichstag. Zhukov purposefully sent his armies across Kornyev's line of advance and, in the confusion, battles took place between them, which is understandable. What is not so easily comprehended is that troops of each army fired on one another as they drew within sight of the building. This was never published, but since the end of the Soviet Union, a variety of first-hand accounts and interviews came out stating that perhaps hundreds had died at their comrades' hands in an effort to be the first unit into the symbolic center of the Nazi empire. In 1933, 5,000 people deemed socially dangerous or socially deviant by the regime were sent to a remote region of Siberia supposedly to one of the many deadly labor camps in the region. It's likely that some of these prisoners were indeed socially dangerous or deviant, as there were many criminals sent to Siberia, along with real and perceived enemies of the regime. Camp administrators and guards used the criminals as enforcers to keep the other prisoners in line. In return, criminals and or criminal gangs received extra food, privileges, etc. Unfortunately, most other prisoners, and likely most especially those dumped on the island of Nazino in the middle of the large Orb River, had no experience with serious violence, and they were likely the first victims of the violence that occurred within a day. You see, the authorities in the Nazino Island area had no experience dealing with this many prisoners being delivered all at once, and had no food or housing for any of them. <laughs> 
rather than go out of their way to find such. And, knowing that most of the prisoners would be dead soon anyway, they simply dumped all 5,000 on Nazino Island, which is not large. This was in May 1933, and though the weather in Siberia is not awful in spring, it was also not great, and there was no food. None. 27 men had died en route to the island. These were the first corpses eaten. When reports reached the guards at their nearby HQ, they had bags of flour sent in. A riot started. The soldiers delivering the flour were nearly killed by the rush of prisoners trying to get to the flour, and they opened fire, killing scores of prisoners. What's more, the criminals on the island hoarded the flour for themselves. Those other prisoners who had nothing to give the gangs, smuggled in gold or jewelry, for example, went hungry. The prisoners, both criminal and not, who did get flour, had nothing to bake it with and no way to start a fire anyway. They mixed the flour with river water. The result was dysentery on a mass scale, and soon scores of prisoners were dying of that very deadly disease, which is easily cured if there is a hospital. By the way, these prisoners also included women. They were the first to go when hunger took away people's minds. One of the surviving accounts describes a young woman who was essentially butchered alive for meat. Once the weakest were gone, the island became the scene of a literal horror movie. Making things worse were the additional 1,000 prisoners dumped on Nazino in late May. By June, there were only 2,000 people left. Those were sent to labor camps, where most died quickly. A handful of survivors lived to later tell the tale, secretly, as did the native people of the area. Some of the guards who had witnessed what had happened or its aftermath were jailed to prevent the stories from leaking out. But by 1988, when glasnost became the policy of the government, the horrors of Nazino became public. Though this next tale is brutal, it is somewhat understandable given the situation in the Middle East in the early to mid-1980s. At that time, various groups of Muslim militants were taking numbers of Americans and Europeans hostage, both for political reasons and at times for cash, which was then used to buy weapons. For a time, Soviet citizens in the Middle East, and especially in Lebanon, where the Soviets were actually helping the militants against both Israeli and US interests, were off-limits. However, in October 1985, Four Soviet diplomats were driving together in war-torn Beirut and were taken hostage. One of the Soviets was wounded in the leg during the assault. Hezbollah demanded that the USSR use diplomatic and political pressure to force the Syrian government to call off its offensive against Hezbollah in the Lebanese city of Tripoli. To show they meant business, Hezbollah killed the wounded Russian diplomat, Arkady Katkov, and left his body in a garbage dump for the Soviets to find. Within hours, the KGB, the dreaded Soviet secret police and intelligence unit chief in Lebanon, went to a meeting with the leading Shia Muslim cleric. Hezbollah was made up of Shia Muslims, and, not too subtly, suggested that not only the Muslims of Lebanon, but perhaps those of Iran, from which Hezbollah took orders, would suffer an accidental missile attack. Included in the threat was mention of the Shia holy city of Qum in Iran. The Soviet message was sent, at least part of it. Part two came when the KGB kidnapped a relative of a Hezbollah leader. The man was castrated. Then he was shot in the back of the head. His organ was sent to his Hezbollah relative. And within a very short time, the three remaining Soviet hostages were released. Lastly, the Soviet regime, especially after Stalin, used psychiatry as a punishment. Or, at least, that was the theory. The Soviet regime was backed by an elaborate ideology that, at its root, sounds peaceful and idyllic, equal rights for all, and the equal sharing of the means of production. In practice, as you likely know, this never happened not even close. What's more, 
From the 1950s and increasing in the 1960s and 70s, many prisoners, rather than being shipped to the Gulag, whose use had been denounced and discouraged to a degree by Premier Nikita Khrushchev in the 1950s, were sent to psychiatric hospitals. Why? Because, according to the regime, anyone who opposed the Soviet system, with its ideology of universal brotherhood, etc., must be insane. Prominent Soviet dissidents, including Andrei Sakharov, the father of the Soviet atomic bomb, were sent to these so-called hospitals. Oftentimes, they and their relatives were told that this was for their own safety. At these facilities, psychoactive drugs, from LSD to the so-called truth serum, sodium pentothal, and others were administered in dangerous doses. Sedatives kept prisoners docile. Electroshock therapy was also used both as punishment, though it was described as treatment. Despite the attempts of the regime to keep these places secret, inmates, their families, and concerned staff smuggled out reports detailing these facilities to the rest of the Soviet Union and the West. They became a serious bone of contention between the United States and the USSR until the latter's demise in 1991, when the Soviet policy was changed. Sadly, the use of psychiatric detention is being used by Russian dictator Vladimir Putin's regime once again, most recently in July 2021.